right, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Um, I'm Maria Solser. I'm an outreach specialist at the Lender Center of Hope. Uh, we are a nonprofit in Mason, Ohio, uh, about 20 miles north of downtown Cincinnati. And welcome everyone to the community education presentation here at the Manor House. We're very thankful for the partnership with community partners, part of Paramedic Network with Bob here, uh, taking care of all of our uh, virtual um, technology and Dr. Chin, who is uh, online with everyone. So thank you so much. We thank the Manor House for this opportunity as well. And, and um, you all for coming out and spending your time. Before I turn it over to Dr. Rodriguez, I did want to give you a little overview. I know those that come regularly have heard this. You probably will be able to do it uh, one of these days, give the overview of the treatment services at the Linder Center. But um, the Linder Center, not far from here, the Manor House, uh, we're a mental health uh, center. Uh, what we do there, we've got 80 beds and we, we work with inpatient partial hospitalization, intensive outpatient for addiction and co-occurring. Uh, we also have full outpatient practice, uh, with psychiatrists, psychologists, nurse practitioners, therapists, working with adolescents and adults. We also do uh, neuromodulation, which is for treatment resistant depression. Uh, that looks like it's called ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, and TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, we also have a full continuum for e eating disorders from inpatient, partial hospitalization, intensive outpatient, and the Harold C. Schott eating disorders team. And then we also do uh, residential treatment. Uh, we've got Williams House where uh, age 18 and over, folks are coming in that maybe need some stabilization. They, they're not treatment ready, so we want to help them get stabilized. And we can do detox medication management and an evaluation to, to really see what um, could be driving uh, the addiction. We wanna evaluate that. Uh, that's a 10 day minimum process. Average length of stay is 28 days. And then we're looking to refer um, the individual out uh, based on the treatment team's recommendation. We also have the Sipsi House, which is where we do, it's all under one roof uh, in Mason. The Sipsi House is where we um, we do a comprehensive diagnostic assessment. We are surrounding the individual with the team and we're teasing out what's going on. We've got a psychiatrist, psychologist, uh, social worker. We're really uh, working to tease out what's going on, create a blueprint, and then make a recommendation for treatment. That's a 10 day minimum process. Average length of stay is 28 days. Um, and again, that's a comprehensive diagnostic assessment. An individual may have uh, diagnosis. They may not have diagnosis, but we're gonna we're gonna work to find out what is going on and and go from there. Make the recommendation. Um, so that's a quick overview of the Linder Center of Hope. If uh, we take um, most commercial insurance, and then on that residential side, the Williams House and Sipsy House, we take uh, private pay, but we can run insurance on the front end for some reimbursement on the back end. So there is private pay on those two units, but uh, most of the other services that we offer for treatment uh, are commercial insurance based. If I can ever help you uh, out in the community or um, anyone that you're connected to, I'm happy to do that in my outreach efforts. And um, just a reminder, there's materials on the back table, help yourself. Um, and then coming up in November, will be Dr. Jennifer Farley. Her parents are here. They haven't, they haven't missed a session, I don't think, in a while. Um, seasonal affective disorder uh, with Dr. Jennifer Farley next month. And then December, we'll close the year out with healthy at every size, weight stigma, and why dieting can be harmful with uh, Dr. Anna Gierczykova. So um, please, if those are of interest, please come back and tell your friends, your work, your coworkers. And um, from there, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Nelson Rodriguez. Um, he's gonna talk to us about what to do when someone is in mental health crisis. He's the lead psychiatrist for our rapid access. And I didn't mention that, but that is something available 
that was created at the Linder Center to help folks that were trying to get into psychiatry have commercial insurance or or not really it doesn't, probably doesn't matter but it is a, it is a private pay but it was set up so that folks could get into psychiatry and we have uh, two afternoons a week that folks can make an appointment and the and the situation was because psychiatry was um, so backed up and folks are having to wait for some months to see a psychiatrist and if they needed medication um, they needed support we wanted to make sure they could have that so two afternoons a week it's called rapid access you can see the lead psychiatrist is Dr. Rodriguez and it's it's been a, a consistent um, busy uh, program from from what I understand folks really uh, that is available it is private pay but two afternoons a week you get in you get a, an assessment with Dr. Rodriguez and a social worker and really um, helping folks they don't decompensate and then end up having to go into inpatient so He's the lead psychiatrist there. He's the director of the electroconvulsive therapy uh, service at the Lender Center, and um, uh, <coughs> the assistant clinical professor at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. And help me welcome Dr. Nelson Rodriguez. Uh, thank you so much, Maria, uh, and. Uh, Good evening to all of you, and uh, also to those who are listening uh, remotely. Um, and uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about this uh, topic. Uh, that is very dear to me, only because of all these experiences as a psychiatrist. Um, has anyone here been involved or had experiences dealing with someone with mental health crisis? So mental health crisis meant, can mean so many things to so many uh, uh, people. Now, uh, as a psychiatrist, I deal with this in the emergency room. I, 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 uh, I cover the US Chester Hospital uh, consult service in psychiatry on weekends. So I see them in the emergency room. I also uh, see them when they get admitted in the hospital at, uh, in their center of hope. And I also see them now in the rapid access service. So I see a whole uh, myriad of presentations. And uh, it can also mean like 10% as a chest pains. And that's what I see in the uh, uh, Westchester Hospital. They get hospitalized for chest pains. And then you get consulted only to find out that it's anxiety in a crisis. So uh, this will be like a, almost like an interactive. There will be a lot of storytelling, if you don't mind, you know, because I'm getting old. So there's a little bit more experience, I think. Uh, my first exposure with mental health crisis is actually when I was still a young doctor in the Philippines. Uh, I think I was an intern. When you're an intern, you get assigned to wherever they want you. So I was assigned to an emergency room and an ambulance. So we were sent and to the community uh, with the driver, with me as the intern, and actually the psychiatrist with a medical bag. So we were all in white coat. So we went to the community and there was one patient that the family were trying to go after. And I said, what's this case? Well, we'll just go, we'll pick this up. I'll take care of, you know. Uh, so when we went to the house, the, the patient cannot be really held down. You know, I think looking back now, I think the patient was probably in a manic, psychotic state. So we have to run after this patient and we have to grapple him with the family, with the, and as soon as we got hold of him, the psychiatrist was ready to give an injection. And I don't know what injection he gave, 
most likely held up at that time. And, and so that was a, 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 an eye-opener for me. And I doubted, you know, psychiatry was the least of my option at the time. I, I wanted to be a family doctor in emergency room. Uh, so uh, I was an emergency room physician in the Philippines and before I became a psychiatrist. So uh, most of my experiences are in both. So there's a lot of crisis when you're from a third world country and then you see the crisis in a different form in a well-developed country. So it's a very big topic. But I want to just uh, focus on three main things. Uh, for us who are here and also listening, we want to uh, be able to identify what are the common manifestations of a mental health crisis. And we want to uh, get out of here becoming aware of uh, appropriate resources to assist them. Those uh, friends, family members, or neighbors who are in acute crisis. Because more often than not, it's happening more in the community. I think what we see in the emergency room, but hospitals are only very tiny bit. Actually, the crisis is happening at the workplace, at home, and in the community. Don't you agree? Yeah. So, and then, uh, as I said, uh, hopefully we'll all become familiar with the rapid access service at the Linder Center of Hope, which is one effort to kind of deal with this. Um, so uh, I found this very interesting uh, data about mental health in America in 2020. And that, I think, was the height of COVID-19 also. And I don't know with you, but that was a big crisis. <laughs> don't you agree? Oh, yes. The first, the first sign that I know that was crisis, my kids who were at the UC, at University of Cincinnati, their college, so they thought that they were just going for like a break. And then as soon as they got come home, my son was crying. And I said, what's going on? Uh, why, why is, why is the, our son crying? And they've got like a text <laughs> from the school that they're not coming back. And they still have a lot of stuff in the university. And they did that, say goodbye to their friends. They just thought that they were going for like a break. I don't know with you, what your experience is, but I thought it was a crisis. And eventually, it was really a crisis. So uh, one in five adults experienced a mental illness in 2020. And more than 12 million had serious thoughts of suicide. Now, to, over the last, after the uh, financial crisis in 2008, the first data coming out of the CDC in 2010 Suicide already went up. When I was a resident, I, th I thought that the data was that suicide was number 12 cause of death in America. But in 2010, see, there's a, a, a financial crisis in 2008. Suicide came up as number 10, where it is right now. And suicide does not only happen to regular folks, it can happen to anybody. In fact, there's now data that physicians, when you look at the percentage, very high suicide among physicians and even psychiatrists. Why do I know? Because my one of my co-residents in psychiatry, I found out committed suicide. So I, I, I know. And because of that, I've been giving lectures on suicide for a while. Um, in 2020, 
more than 17 million had delayed or canceled appointments. And how do I know? Well, when COVID came in, everything was shut down, even mental health care. The only thing that was not shut down was Lindner. They were still operating. And even our service, I ran the ECT service. Now, sometimes people think that ECT is just a, like a, a regular procedure, but there are some very acutely ill patients at that time that needed ECT. So most ECT services were also shut down, except for us. Although we cut back on the number of patients that we were treating, and in fact, even the hospital, there were days where it, or weeks where it, we had to shut down one unit and only one unit. Why? Because even staff were not, were also getting sick. So there was a lot of uh, things that was going on. And 7.3 million experienced delays in getting prescriptions. And I came to see them also because our rapid access was still open, although even if it's telehealth. At the height of 2020, I saw two patients who get to the rapid access because they cannot get hold of their psychiatrist. Their psychiatrist is gone. They don't know where they are. So they, they, the private <laughs> practice was shut down also. So there was a lot. And people were, they called me from Texas. Uh, can you call prescription? Because the, there were like Filipinos who came here to visit. And now they can't go out because everything was shut down. So I have to call in from Ohio. <laughs> What, what, what medication? So doctors were, and I'm so glad that at least states eventually cut off that, uh, you know, or allow doctors to kind of uh, uh, do prescription in different states, even if you don't have any. So this one is very big crisis, in my opinion. 4.9 million were unable to access needed care. And even now, I think this is a crisis. Uh, and telehealth. It used to be like a very minimal portion of practice. Uh, the University of Kentucky already have like a system of telehealth providing needed care in isolated rural areas. But this was in a very well-established uh, university setting. After COVID, oh boy, it's like telehealth became the normal practice. And even now, you know. So how do we define, because uh, even a, a psychiatrist, uh, you know, I have an idea about it. We still have to define, we have to have a common language. When we say somebody is in mental health crisis, I think this definition from the National Alliance of Mental Illness seems to be very nice. Um, a mental health crisis is any situation in which a person's behavior puts them at risk of hurting themselves or others and or prevents them from being able to care for themselves or function effectively in the community. Actually, those are the three elements a psychiatric home. You know, when you pink slip somebody, these are the three elements. So for this talk, I wanted to understand why this crisis. So it led me to so many uh, uh, definitions, so many approaches. And I thought this one is the simplest that I can actually understand. <laughs> you know, uh, so this is like a uh, like a, an author, an expert, and probably is talking about crisis and crisis and how to deal with crisis. So I thought to share it with you because I think it's helpful for me as a psychiatrist. How can I approach a certain situation? Now, in this world, <laughs> there are so many crises. Uh, like a few days ago, 
there's a big typhoon that went to my hometown and flooding. That's a crisis when animals and people were drowning or, you know, uh, Ukraine. That's a crisis too. Whether we like it or not, we're far away, but, you know, it's also a crisis. Uh, there was also like a, like a tornado that went through Northern Kentucky at one time. And in Kentucky, we've been, you know, most recently the one in Florida. Put yourself in that situation of a family member, uh, probably in those islands or Fort Myers. It was close to me. I, I know of a friend, my best friend and co-resident. His brother in Fort Myers is a neurologist. I know that they got affected. So that's also a form of crisis. So in any crisis, there are stages that people go through. There's a warning of a crisis, like a hurricane, you know, warning. Uh, we'll talk about the warning signs of mental health crisis. Risk assessment, our response to what's going on and how to manage that crisis. And then eventually there's resolution to it. And what we will hope to achieve is also a recovery from it. And in fact, in psychiatry, as long as you get on time at the early part of their crisis or mental health illness, I think the recovery is a lot better. I see it because with me, with what I'm doing right now, I see them as a young college students in crisis. So they see us because they can't function at school anymore. Parents pick them up in those nice, nice universities or colleges out of Ohio. They bring them here. They bring us them to the rapid access service and we see them. We help them and we see them go back to school and finish their school. I also do ECT on somebody who has not been uh, getting any better with medications and I do them. So I see that if they get treated and assessed at the early part of their symptoms, the recovery I think is a lot better. And that's basically what we want to achieve. Or, you know, so we already discussed the impact of COVID-19. I think this is a little bit, uh, I tried to uh, uh, copy and paste from, <laughs> from Google, uh, but we'll go one by one. Because as I said, we have to understand the warning signs of somebody who's in mental health crisis. And don't worry, you know, you can find this in the internet, you know, uh, from the NAMI, and you will also find it in the last page of my presentation. Um, the warning signs of a mental health crisis from the National Alliance on Mental Illness, the inability to perform daily tasks. You see it. Uh, I have to also be careful, you know, am I depressed, am I, am I having a crisis? But you see that they are not taking care of themselves anymore. Uh, they are a little bit sad, a little bit stressed out, and then they isolate themselves. They, they don't take care of themselves anymore. And family, are, uh, sometimes it's, it's hard if the patient is, they don't even probably realize it. It's the people around them that notice it. You know, rapid mood swing, increased energy level, inability to stay still, pacing. <laughs> Uh, suddenly depressed or withdrawn, suddenly happy or calm after a period of depression. Um, we see them actually in a inpatient unit because they get hospitalized, they get picked up by police, the family call the police, they get picked up, they go to the emergency room and eventually they get into the inpatient. And even if you're not a psychiatrist, once you see somebody in a full mania, like mental health, uh, our staff knows the difference. You have a very unique person who is 
uh, unable to stop talking, uh, pacing, has not been sleeping for a few days. And they're acting differently. Um, they're probably uh, spending a lot of money too, online gambling, or somebody I think went every day to the casino and losing a lot of money, you know. Uh, increased agitation, verbal threats, out of control behavior, and destroying property. Or abusive behavior to sell for others. And then they try to calm themselves down by using substances or self harming behavior. And then isolation from school, work, family, and friends. With the increased agitation, I think that is very common in the community. Uh, usually, it's the teachers in school who will deal, have to deal with them, family members, community members who have to deal with somebody who's uh, manifesting the symptoms. In the workplace, that's also like a uh, increasing uh, place where violence, uh, and in fact, later on, we'll see what the National Institute of Occupational Safety Health are talking about. Because uh, they most, more often than not, will see them in all those places, and not just in the hospital or in the emergency room. And then, as the uh, illness progress, or if they have an uh, underlying uh, psychosis, they are unable to recognize family or friends. They're very confused. They even have strange ideas. And in fact, I was just uh, talking to somebody. For whatever reason, you know, there's even like a, they used to be very good, they are working, they uh, achieve a certain level, and they have some delusions about their neighbors. Or even, uh, probably even the FBI or the police, they're worried that they're coming after them. And they're being targeted. Uh, to be killed. Somebody was saying, oh, uh, there's a meme that they saw in Facebook and they feel like it's them <laughs> that they are uh, talking about. And and the, this, this patient was not even, not even open to the possibility that they are not the ones that being targeted. Does I understand what people are saying when they're so psychotic? Uh, forget about it. It's like they are in a certain world of their own. They start hearing voices or see things that aren't there. Uh, paranoia, you know, the suspicion and mistrust of people or their actions without evidence or justification. And that's why I'm actually two patients. There's actually three. I've been, I'm, <laughs> I don't know whether it's from COVID, COVID related, or something like that. The problem is, it's happening. People who are previously not involved in any mental health care, and this is what I've seen. And there's an ongoing discussion among psychiatrists about this. Why do some people who have been relatively doing well in their career, in their family, and how to the blue develop paranoia, delusion. And then they act it out. Unfortunately, people also kill themselves because they cannot deal with the paranoia anymore. They cannot deal with it. So they do something. <coughs> so those are the warning signs. Now, all of us, I think, has to be aware of all those, because it's not going to be your patient. I don't know how many of you are mental health clinicians or anything. It's probably going to be one, people around you, friends or family members, who might manifest this, or even co-workers, you know. So, so what to do? 
The second phase is, aside from knowing what are the warning signs, how can we assess it? But are there ways to even assess? And in fact, I think uh, um, this is a very good one, very simple one from NAMI also. You have to assess the urgency of the situation. Is the person in danger of hurting themselves, others, or property? Do you need emergency assistance? Do you have time to start with a phone call for guidance and support from a mental health professional? The last one I think is the hardest to do. You know, but what you can assess as a, as a uh, community member is to probably the first two and know where to call. Probably 911 if there's a family member acting out or a friend or neighbor or, you know. And, you know, um, I think there are now increasing numbers of, uh, aside from 911, I think there will be for mental health crisis, there is now 988. Are you familiar with 988? No. No? Yeah. So there is now a recently established number for mental health crisis. That's 988. And this is uh, coming out of this uh, group now for the uh, advocating for a better delivery of uh, mental health crisis, or some would say behavioral health care crisis. So we talk about the risk assessment for violence or suicide, because those are the two main uh, mental health crises that are very, very important. The third one that we discuss about not being able to take care of themselves are some, sometimes in the elderly group. You know, uh, so the Center for Disease um, or the, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention through the uh, National Institute of Occupational Safety and, and Health, or NIOSH, has identified so many factors to be aware of or to even assess in your own mind. Uh, potential for, for violence. And they're promoting this in the workplace. I don't know whether you're aware or familiar that there was a, a patient, I think, in Pennsylvania who went in and shoot the doctors. So, so it's happening. Like uh, patients going into a clinic or hospital and shooting their own doctors. That's why we have like a code silver training or, you know, at UC and even at the, uh, the Linder Center of Hope. I put it in my, so that you know what to do in case something happens. So there are several risk factors uh, that they have identified. There are individual risk factors like a victim of a uh, history of violent victimization, low IQ, substance use, high emotional stress, antisocial beliefs and attitudes. With the last one, you know, uh, again, uh, antisocial beliefs and attitudes, usually the antisocial tendency starts when they are still young, you know. Uh, Antisocial personality disorder, we define them as somebody who has been hurting their uh, pets or animals, you know, get involved in so many uh, problems at school, you know, always going to the principal's office. Um, and then also uh, family risk factors, authoritarian child bearing attitudes, low parental involvement, for family functioning, low emotional attachments to uh, parents or caregivers. Um, probably some of these are kids, patients, or somebody who just is feeling left alone. 
like disconnected. And peer and social risk factors, association with delin delinquent peers, social rejection by peers and involvement eventually, like a continuing, like a, a seeking out a group that might accept them in the government. And also community risk factors, like the means economic opportunities, high level of transiency, high level of family disruption. So those are just among the few that has been uh, identified as possible risk factors for violence. And there's, in the second slide, we'll talk about what they are promoting, you know, how do you deal with that? So the next one that you have to assess is, uh, is there a risk for suicide on this patient? Now, at least in psychiatry, in psychiatry, I think this is the model that has been used all over. I think if you, uh, use this, you'll probably be able to identify somebody who's most at risk of suicide. So among psychiatry, this is our like a blood pressure <laughs> or blood sugar or, you know, if you use this, then uh, you will be able to identify who is most at risk of suicide. Let me see if I can read it. So you have to understand, you have to ask this patient directly. There are several items here. Are you able to read it or not really? Okay. So have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? That will be answered with yes immediately by somebody who's already <coughs> planning to do it. Or want to seek help. Have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? So those are the two screening. Whether they want to go to sleep and not wake up or they have actually been thinking about it. And when they answered yes, then now you follow them up with several questions. Have you been thinking about how you might do this? Their actions. Have you had these thoughts and had some intention of acting? So you're already talking about their intention, not only the thoughts anymore, but intention, their plan, how they are going to do it. And have you started to work out or work out the details of how to kill yourself and do you intend to carry out this plan? I'm telling you some stories of patients who actually committed suicide <laughs> because it's psychiatrists had seen them. You know, one of them is a very young, young person and has been hospitalized. I will not say a word in some community hospitals before they come to the living room. And this patient eventually has been uh, eventually committed suicide. But over the past several months, this patient has history of researching, researching how to do it. And in fact, part of our understanding later on that actually he was an Amazon buying like a, a there was a discussion this morning again of this nitrite. It's free, uh, it's, it's available online that you can actually buy it. I think it's a really, can you really buy it? Yes, Dr. Rodriguez, it's for preservative. It's like, you know, it's in your bacon <laughs> or if you preserve meat, you know, really? and. And it looks like a, they call it like a patients turn blue when they overdose on it. So it actually kids 
research things, unfortunately. And if they have a phone or a computer, it becomes so easy. And you may not believe this, because I, I still can't believe it what I was told earlier. But actually, at Amazon, there's a suicide kit. Do you even believe it? <laughs> that there's a suicide kit telling you what to buy and how to do it. I, I still have to go and I have an Amazon account. I will try to look for that. But I, I think there are things that, you know, that some kids are now exposed to that are probably our generation was not. Did you have Amazon when you were growing up? Or internet? No. You have to go out and play, isn't it? Like you have to have somebody. But now everything is online, even games. You have to be, you have to go out and be dirty. I think Bob knows that. Absolutely. <laughs> you have to go out and be with your friends and you have to have some scratches, you know, while you're playing in the field. And now anymore, all you have to do is to go to the internet. But I was really surprised if that's true. And I still have to verify it. If they have availability or, or you can order online a suicide kit, that's terrible for us in this field. So NIOSH, the, the, the agency about uh, workplace safety. Talk about like uh, there's, there's a crisis workplace to identify or even the community or working with people. This crisis is the end result. It's the last stage. Usually they are, you know, just me, probably even some of you have normal stress in life. Who is not anxious? about what's going on, war, uh, or the inflation or whatever, uh, the election, uh, the uh, stress of uh, knowing that your friends are uh, being flooded in, in some other parts of the world, in the Philippines. So it, it elevates your anxiety, whether you like it or not. But then at work, you have to be aware of any rising anxiety level, uh, probably a little bit more relationship related. Uh, probably what I hear sometimes is like some companies get bought in and they bring in new uh, uh, bosses. Before you know it, they're there to kind of basically kick you out. If you're stressed and anxiety level, and after that crisis, and I think we have seen some of them in, as manifested by shooting in the workplace or anything like that. Um, so it's kind of a very rough and tough world out there. But here we are. Uh, our goal is to understand what, what can actually we do. So the, the third component of dealing with the crisis is how to respond. Respond probably to our family member, friend, uh, our workmate in the workplace. Uh, and again, this is from Nami. Uh, keep your voice calm. For me, that is the hardest <laughs> thing to do. Bob asked me, have you been like a core commander? And I said, yeah, or <laughs> like a, a drill surgeon. <laughs> uh, so it's hard for me to keep my voice calm. And even if I'm, I feel like I'm talking to you sweetly, it still comes across as very loud <laughs> or very rough. I don't, I don't know. But that's what my goal is to how to uh, keep my voice calm. Avoid overreacting. Just listen to the person 
express support and concern, avoid continuous eye contact, especially if they are paranoid or delusional. They might think that you are also part of the problem. Eventually, you become uh, part of the problem. Uh, ask how you can help and keep stimulation level low. Move slowly when you're dealing with them. Offer options instead of trying to take control. Probably offer them some water, candy, or whatever, or just a uh, place to uh, chill out. Avoid touching the person unless you ask permission and be patient. And most of all, I think give them space. Don't make them feel trapped. <laughs> so if you go to a psychiatrist's office, <laughs> we were trained, okay, to set up your office so that your patient can actually is the nearest to the uh, you're not supposed to be, uh, you know, near near the door. The patient should be allowed to leave the office if they want to. So there is a uh, there's a common knowledge that, or at least in training, that don't set your office up to feel like it's a trap. <laughs> and you know why? I've seen it. <laughs> in the rapid access service, you know, <laughs> we have a code. Uh, when when my uh, staff and I said, I think this might be a case for a BBN. What is BBN? I don't know. If you know, I'm from Kentucky, so big blue nation. <laughs> so we use that code. I use it because I said I'm from Kentucky. When we uh, cheer up our UK basketball, it's called BBN, big blue nation. But it's a code to notify our security, our blue officers, to be aware that we may need to on this case. And in fact, we did. Because the patient was about to run, you know, he was increasingly agitated, increasingly, so they helped us calm him down. And was able to kind of, and then he said, I want to call the police, I want to call the police. And the security, the police said, we are the police here. <laughs> Because they are delegated as the police at Linder Center. Well, we are the police here. You know, how can we help you? So they were very nice. And I think they have training. <laughs> and we talk about that crisis intervention training, CIT. So they were able to calm the patient down. They were able to, uh, you know, and on our way out to the intake where he would be assessed for admission, he tried to run away. <laughs> So the good thing is that there were already two security officers with us, so they were able to bring him back to the hospital. So I'm telling you those stories, uh, you know, but there's actually, are you familiar with this? Mental health first aid. Are you familiar with uh, first aid? Do you have a first aid kit at home or a medical first aid? Okay, how about mental health per se? Is this your first time to hear about this? Yes. yes. Okay, and that's okay because I myself came to know about this in 2009. I was in uh, Italy actually, and I was uh, attending like a, a week long, actually two weeks <laughs> in our Via to Italy. And we were discussing crisis, how to deal with trauma, because the course and the six month long course is actually about trauma. Uh, how to deal with, uh, you know, people in the community suffering from natural disasters, um, anybody who has been involved in traumatic experiences, domestic violence, you know, abuse, uh, child abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, all those kind of things, but also even with natural disasters. At the time, people in in Haiti suffered, that had a big earthquake. In Japan, they have also a big earthquake. So, but this has been going on. Uh, I think even in America, and the reason why I mention it is because 
this is also to let you know that there, this is being offered to groups or even to individuals. I'm a board member of the uh, Mental Health America of uh, Northern Kentucky and Southwest Ohio, because we merged them. I started with uh, Mental Health America of Northern Kentucky, and then because of logistics and everything, we tried, they combined it, and I stayed on as board of director, and they have a very good program uh, funded by somebody, and they were offering this in, in our region. Uh, if you're not, if you are interested to know more about this, because this is now being uh, taught to people in the community. If you're interested, you know, if there's a group who are interested to learn more about mental health first aid, which is being promoted across America right now, because whether you like it or not, there's not a lot of psychiatrists or mental health professionals. Do we agree on that one? Yeah. So most likely you and I will be the first who will have to deal with this. So they recognize that it's actually, it's better to educate teachers, police officers, people who are responding, uh, people who are in the community basically. So have access to some of these patients who might be in crisis, even if it's just depression, loneliness, dealing with the, somebody who lost their family member, somebody who lost their home in a tragedy, fire or hurricane or any natural disasters before they become a crisis. It's called mental health per se. When I was in, in, uh, in 2009, actually I became more aware of the Australian because in Australia, this is a well-developed, because uh, we see Australia as a big country, but they also have like uh, rural areas and they don't have a lot of psychiatrists as well. So this is pretty much implemented all over the world that have uh, poor you know, or low very low mental health providers compared to the community. So they train uh, rural health workers. And uh, combining it with what we discussed earlier about from NAMI, how to approach a patient in uh, crisis, they have what they call algae formula. And when you go and train uh, for mental health first aid, this is basically the formula, algae, A-L-G-E-E. -E. Approach the person, assess, and assist with any crisis, like we talked about. Listen and communicate non-judgmentally. Using your, if you're a nurse, your uh, uh, tender nursing care, you know, um, if you're a social worker, you know, um, or just plain and simple, just listening and trying to be present with them. And in fact, in a certain crisis, that's what they need, somebody to listen to their vent out. They have some emotions that they want to share, to vent out. And having somebody capable or willing to listen to them that's all they need at that moment. Give support and information about where to get help. Because uh, more often than that, you're probably not a therapist or a psychiatrist. So encourage them to seek help somewhere. You know? Um, so encourage uh, the person to get appropriate professional help because more often than not, you are not a therapist, you are not a psychiatrist. But after this lecture, you are now a little bit more familiar about the resources in the community. And that's what I would like to do is to share with you what are the resources here 
and in our region and encourage other supporters, like probably a friend, a pastor, a priest, or somebody that they can trust, or a lawyer. <laughs> if they're going through like a marital, you know, I'm sure my, my uh, idol, Bob Brady, is really going to a lawyer right now. <laughs> Not a joke, okay? <laughs> but encourage them. To uh, other supporters or their friends, you know. So, are you now more familiar with what they call mental health first aid? So, there is such a thing as mental health first aid, not just physical first aid that we are all familiar. So, uh, we now go to management. Uh, we now was able to approach somebody who is uh, in a crisis, we talk to them, we approach them in a calm manner, we guided them, we listened to them, we did not judge them, we did not say that they're bad or whatever, we just listened and uh, what they call like um, the empathy, uh, trying to be in their shoes. And I think that's the key empathy, how to be in somebody's shoes at that moment. So uh, in terms of management, you know, if they have a psychiatrist, then you can probably uh, give them a call or a clinic nurse or their therapist, uh, case manager, if they're involved in, uh, in some of our, uh, our I think uh, there are case managers, of uh, community mental health uh, or family physician that is familiar with the person's history. And if the situation is life threatening or there's potential for violence, definitely call 911. Now there's now a uh, call 988, I believe. So why do you call 911? More often than that, at least in this uh, country, there will be a medical or first responders and law enforcement who will eventually bring the patient most likely to the emergency room because they can now uh, sign uh, more often than that. Uh, the <coughs> hold is actually signed by a police officer when I see a patient in the emergency room. It's not even like a uh, mental health professional. It's usually the uh, law enforcement officer who signed those uh, holds. And then they can, uh, from the emergency room, they can now go to a different hospital. It's always preferable to have them admitted voluntarily, but more often than that, they don't want to be admitted. <laughs> so well, even after threatening to hurt themselves or others, so you have to do involuntary call. Uh, I think in Hamilton County or downtown Cincinnati, they have these uh, psychiatric emergency services at the uh, UC Medical Center. And here at the Lunar Center of Hope, we have the Access and Referral Center, or what we call the intake at Lindner. And I think uh, that is manned more or less uh, 24 seven, I believe. Uh, I know uh, because uh, they call us. Um, But you and I know that there's actually, in my opinion, a mental health care access crisis. I don't know whether you believe it or not. Who among you doesn't believe it? Or who among you believe that there's a crisis in terms of getting psychiatric help right now? Or for your family and friends? I know that there's a crisis in access because when my kids have like a problem in their skin, you call a, a dermatologist and you won't see a dermatologist within six months. <laughs> well, you, you need it right now, it's already. <laughs> uh, isn't that the crisis? And, 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 uh, and I believe that there's a crisis, you know. There's challenges in getting new psychiatric appointments. Right now, in our setting, this is what I hear 
from patients that I see in the rapid access. Permanent call, UC Medical Center, Psychiatric Services, and Psychiatric Mental Health Department or Psychiatry Department. And this patient was told that give us a call in January to get into our wait list. So right now they cannot deal with you. If you are like, uh, I'm depressed, I, I need to be assessed. Uh, if, if this is true, okay, but this is a patient that I just saw yesterday. <laughs> so Dr. Rodriguez, we're very near UC, they're from Northern Kentucky. I want to, be fo to follow up to get assessed there. But when we called, we were told that give them a call in January to get into their waiting list. It doesn't even mean that you will eventually see, but you will just be in the waiting list. So every three months, you'll be in the waiting list. And so they did not only call. Uh, so did you call somebody somewhere else? Yes. It's, uh, the, the nearest that they can give us an appointment is actually six to eight months. And in my own experience, we draft, uh, we, before we thought about the rapid access service, because there's no such a thing as a rapid access service for mental health. Are you familiar with anybody who has that? I think there are some, uh, like a uh, assessment. Um, how we happen is uh, I was seeing a, a patient at Westchester Hospital. The patient was actually a nurse and was admitted to the medical floor because of a chest pain being worked up for a heart attack. So I got a consult to assess anxiety. But that was because the patient was also ex expressing anxiety. So I saw the patient and we talk, listen, you know, there's only 45 minutes of listening, especially if you're not in a rush. <laughs> Most doctors are in a rush. Don't you agree? <laughs> so I had the opportunity, be the nurse, you have to be nice, you know, calling. So sit down and listen. And she said, Dr. Rodriguez, I've been calling and calling and calling. And the nearest that I was able to get an appointment was six months. So somebody finally said, gave me a six month appointment. But I have been very anxious. I've increased my alcohol use. And then my, my chest hurt, that's why I'm here. But the patient was not having cardiac, he's not having any heart problem, at least I know, because I, I, I saw the work on. It's really just anxiety <coughs> or stress. So I told her, uh, probably, are you able to come and see me, you know, within a month at dinner, you know? But that was uh, the impetus, the situation wherein I said, this is not right. When patient who is seeking help can be seen immediately or now, I said, in medicine, at least we have the urgent care. Are you all familiar with urgent care? So I said, why can't we establish something like that, like an urgent care? Uh, like where you can just see somebody get assessed and uh, get a diagnosis and get treated or started on some treatment and be guided. Now, uh, can I ask you honestly, do you know all the resources of a mental health facility like the Linder Center of Hope? Can you raise your hand if you, you know all the services? Or do you even know the numbers? <laughs> no, isn't it? It's hard. Uh, but that's what I'm going to give you, some numbers, uh, so that you can share with friends or family. So, one of our tasks is uh, as Maria mentioned earlier, and I hope that uh, this concept of establishing 
and urgent care for mental health will come on. We have started it at Lindner. Uh, and, and because there's no such a thing, it took us two years from the idea that I was proposing. Because there's no model. How, how do you do this? Who will pay for it? Who will uh, man it? How are you going to do it? So there's really no model about this. So we developed it on our own and uh, make sure that somebody get like a, an appointment within a few days. That's the reason why we call it rapid access. I made sure that we don't have any Asia scheduled a month later. <laughs> no. If we're going to see them within a few days or the following week, you know, we'll offer them something else. There's only, I think, one or two weeks, a few months back, where we were booked up for two weeks. But more often than that, you give a call. That's why we don't have, I don't know who is scheduled in my rapid access until I come that Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. And uh, so, uh, the first thing that happens is like uh, we make sure that this patient has enough time to talk about themselves and their issue. Because this is like a crisis in a way. Like if you have a, a young college student, even a male, when you're talking to a college male student, the first thing that, the last thing that they want to do is to get psychiatric assessment. <laughs> I've heard it. They were forced to come. They were forced to come for assessment. But you know that they're in crisis. They're, you know, just partying and not going to school and failing. And before you know it, mom, I need to get from home. I, I've been using a lot of this, a lot of that. You know, I think I, I use more marijuana than I've used for a year, et cetera, et cetera, you know. And you know that they're failing, you know, so they are in a crisis mode, so they come. And it's even hard to even engage them, but at least they get assessed. So what we do is like, uh, you see the social worker first for a complete psychosocial assessment, uh, because that's their strength, you know, who you are as a person. We have to know who you are. Where are you right now in your life? What are your resources? Are there pending legal issues? Are there marital issues? Are there school issues? Are there financial issues? Those things, you know, um, that is done by the social worker. And my social worker even knows whether the patient needs to be admitted. <laughs> because she used to work at the PES. Psychiatric Emergency Services, so she knows. So when she when she tells me that I think this may need uh, assessment or admission, I'm already a little bit. So after uh, she uh, she attends the patient for an hour, we talk about it. I get a, a report and a glimpse, a synopsis of the case. So at least I know when I interview the patient after presenting the case to me for five minutes or 10 minutes, I see the patient for an after hour. Usually the patient comes in with family members. This is always good and nice because you, you can get a different perspective uh, of the whole situation and the family and everything. So that's another hour. And that's when we at least give them a, a feedback about what's going on. A little bit of a diagnosis. I think 80% will probably be right. <laughs> it's not going to be 100% that we're right in our diagnosis because these are ongoing assessment eventually. And then we provide them with all the resources that's available. Uh, 
at Linder and also in the community. Um, what we can provide, we set them up for like an appointment with a therapist or even a, a follow up with a nurse practitioner if there's somebody who has an opening. If not, we send them to their primary care physician for their medications or another clinicians in the community. But at least they get started. They know all the resources. They also get, if there's an urgent need and there's been some suicidal thinking, but they are still safe, at least we send them to our partial hospital program where they can uh, now learn some coping skills. Um, because at Tinder Center of Hope, and Maria mentioned that a little bit, like we have so many resources. But we have the inpatient unit, two of them. Uh, there's even like an adolescent unit, but that's run by the uh, children's hospital. We have partial hospital program where they just come. Uh, they live at home. But for two weeks, they attend our partial hospital program. And I call it like a two week seminar on life skills because that's how they learn what is cognitive behavior therapy skills, what are like uh, DBT skills, what is mindfulness. I even see them sometimes in the gym with their yoga mat. I think there's a yoga instructor who comes in and teach them how to do yoga. How many here do yoga? I wanted to try it because I keep hearing about it. And I have friends, I have a vibrant group who's into yoga, mostly doctors, but you know, I'm hard headed. I still have to <laughs> be convinced that it works, but I know that it works. And I even hear them have some drumming, like even the power of music, music therapy. But sometimes you have to learn this. You know, learn some coping skills that you can use on your own. Because there are, there are coping skills that people can learn, should be aware of, that you can actually use even good eating habits, good sleep habits, you know. And even the concept of self-care. I've been a doctor for how many years? And nobody told me about self-care. You know why? Because they want the doctors to keep working. <laughs> like five minutes? Yeah. So, so everybody wants doctors. If you're an intern, you have to do all the work. You know, uh, the surgeons who are very young in their career or training, they do all the hard work. The first time that I heard about healthcare, uh, self care, to take care of yourself physically, emotionally, mentally, socially, uh, economically, or, and even spiritually, is in Italy. When I was already a psychiatrist there, so that's 2009. That was a long one. And how I wish I heard that. So, what do <laughs> some doctors do? They drink. They drink. We, we just drink it all. <laughs> when they, when they call it Friday Club. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure everybody has their own way of, uh, you know. Uh, and I got involved. And that was when I was training in Boston. And do you know who, who was drinking on a Friday Club? Psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. So, we're finishing up. So hopefully we were able to at least go through some of this, uh, see mental health crisis as a form of crisis. But there are warning signs, which we talk about. There's risk assessment, especially for violence and, and, uh, and the suicide. How to respond, at least even in the community, which most will probably happen or in the workplace or in our own setting with friends or whatever. Management, that, that's a little bit more uh, on the hospital level or psychiatrist or uh, mental health professional level. Resolution, 
Hopefully the crisis goes away and eventually recovery. So in terms of the resolution and recovery phase, I think there are two main things that we need to understand. Personal advocacy and a, creating a crisis plan, especially once we're dealing with somebody with well-established diagnosis of uh, schizophrenia or even uh, like a uh, bipolar, when you hear those diagnoses and when they have history of hurting themselves or, you know, uh, creating violence among their peers. So there has to be some crisis plan. So uh, personal advocacy is like uh, educating yourself about available resources and services and understanding the patient and client's rights. And so uh, even, you know, uh, resources like uh, telephone numbers of your psychiatrist, therapist, uh, medications, what are you taking? And uh, whom to call, who's your best friend? You know, uh, those kind of uh, things. So that when you meet somebody, at least you have those data because they will be asking you those. those. Now, develop a crisis plan. A crisis plan, uh, again, from NAMI, is a written plan developed by the person with mental health condition and their support team, typically family and friends. Um, uh, some helpful tips is that to create a safe environment by removing all weapons and sharp objects, lock up medications, limit their access to their uh, potentially deadly overdose medications, discuss with others in the household about how to stay safe during a crisis, uh, post the number of the county mental health service team, and uh, they contact and share the crisis plan with local law enforcement, especially those that have some potential for violence or people who are, you know, hard to manage at home. Uh, so as we uh, discussed earlier, there's a crisis in mental health uh, delivery, and there's also ongoing mental health crisis, you know, uh, among community members, and even sometimes family members. So what what this group, and in fact, I have I have the article, <laughs> and it's very recent. It is a, that's the latest, uh, uh, I think, uh, periodical uh, newsletter. There's a, actually a group, uh, Margie Balfour is the author of this article that I was reading about the future of behavioral health crisis care. And uh, they're saying that, uh, okay, we would like to attain a certain level where somebody with heart, chest pain, or even a stroke can easily call and the network hospital system has a stroke system. If you are having a symptom of stroke, it's so easy. And actually we have a timer. <laughs> We have management protocols of somebody who's having some stroke in the community. So even the uh, paramedics have a, a timeline that they need to assess. They need to assess this patient immediately and they know what to call the nearest emergency room or hospital stroke care uh, network part of them. And they already have ready team to deal with this patient. And I've seen a very positive uh, result of this. Because it used to be like, once you have a stroke, you will be paralyzed. But I said, this patient has a stroke, but the patient is walking, talking. I said, oh, wow. <laughs> and I think this is the result of that immediate stroke care team that gets deployed once somebody is having a stroke in the community that's activated by the paramedic or the 911 staff. So the, and even when you have a heart problem, a chest pain, there's a cardiac team ready to deal with you. When somebody's mental health crisis, I think there's a team. So, so there, they prove this. And in fact, I think you may not know it, but UC has developed some systems already. Uh, so uh, at the top, it's always the person in crisis because that's basically our focus. 
person who's in mental health crisis, involving community support, and then clinical practices. Right now, if you ask me, is there like a uh, like a clinical practice about uh, we have uh, treatment parameters, practice guideline on dealing with somebody with depression or with depression, with bipolar, schizophrenia, uh, and how to assess suicidality. Yes, we have that. Uh, so there are clinical practices, uh, service continuum, array of services also, you know, uh, and the capacity. The problem sometimes is that there are no beds available in the community. Uh, so it, 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 it gets more and more difficult to place somebody in the emergency room if all the beds of psychiatric facilities in the area are already filled or marked. Uh, sometimes we even go send them to Columbus. It's a little bit far, you know. And accountability and finance. Who will pay for it? So, so eventually, uh, just like anything else, we also have to. Uh, I think they also want to make sure that the treatment or how to approach this is also towards less restricted setting. If you can do this in the community, the better, and it is less costly. So. But at the same time, it should uh, uh, should be able to address uh, somebody, a person in crisis. So the first line is actually calling the uh, mobile crisis or the crisis line of 988. And they said that 80% gets resolved on the phone. And in fact, there's a suicide line, there's a uh, <coughs> mental uh, health crisis line, the 988. I think there's uh, somebody uh, answering that, I don't know where. Um, this is like a uh, if you are in any other emergency, nine one one. This is now the nine one one for mental health crisis, nine eighty. And I think it's already active. So and then mobile crisis. If if that doesn't get resolved, there is a mobile crisis team that gets the uh, uh, and then. I think it's also uh, like a collaborative response with law enforcement. So there's law enforcement and there's also the crisis. Uh, and in fact, I think the University of Cincinnati already has a mobile crisis mental health response team in place. If you have not heard it, they already have it. And I hopefully in other communities, they also have that already. Um, then active care facilities uh, like UC as a uh, psychiatric emergency services where they get to be assessed. And I think they hold them until the crisis. If the crisis doesn't dissipate, then they get admitted. They get transferred to an inpatient care facility. And then the piece here, the community or residential care is also, I think, um, so what from the acute crisis facilities, where do they go? If not in a hospital in Asia, which I think sometimes is limited because of the capacity. So where would they go? So they are recommending or at least developing this uh, community and residential care somewhere uh, with the post-crisis wraparound services or a crisis residential and crisis respite place where they can get, uh, you know, treatment. Now, have you even tried going to like a residential program? We do have some residential programs, but right now, uh, I think most of most of residential that I know are out of pocket. There's very few insurance that uh, uh, covers the residential programs. Uh, and they can even stay there in community-based care for more than 45 days. So hopefully the result of this uh, initiative or effort by experts that are now also being implemented in the community is the reduction, decreased use of the jail for patients who are uh, a little bit violent or have mm -hmm. violence, decreased use of the emergency room and decreased use of the hospital. 
you know. But you have to uh, activate so many systems before you get to that. But I think <laughs> this seems to be a very nice initiative, in my opinion, to make it make the treatment less restrictive and least costly. Try to keep it in the community near where they live. <laughs> so in summary, mental health crisis is very challenging. It happens. It's happening every day. At home, in the community, among our friends, you know, um, and even places that are far from us. But it's happening. Um, it becomes our concern when it involves people near us. But it's happening. Um, and there's ways to deal with them as we itemized. Uh, having the paradigm of how to deal with the crisis. So there are resources available in the community. And I hope that uh, those listening online have identified resources in their own community also. Here in Cincinnati, we have the Psychiatric Emergency Services. I know that uh, when I trained in uh, Cambridge, in Boston, they do have psychiatric emergency services also. So I was so happy actually to hear that Cincinnati also have this <laughs> psychiatric emergency services. Like an emergency care specifically for those with depression or suicide or anything. And there's not there's not a lot. There's not a lot of places or cities who have this psychiatric emergency service or even hospitals go around the hospitals in this uh, city. How many has dedicated psychiatric emergency services? Only one that you see. But they all have emergency care. Uh, so there's also mobile crisis mental health response teams already at UC. And I think it's ongoing. It's being developed, I think, in the uh, community mental health system. Uh, we have the access and referral center for intake at uh, Lindner with their number and the rapid access for those who are not needing an acute care yet or hospitalization, but they it's like an urgent care for mental health. Uh, you can also go online. Uh, this navigating a mental health crisis, a NAMI resource guide for those experiencing men mental health emergency is very helpful. It's more extensive. There are several pages. I only borrowed a couple or a few of them that I highlighted in my talk tonight. And then hopefully all of you are now familiar with mental health first aid. And there's also crisis intervention team that are are being uh, uh, promoted among law enforcement agencies. Uh, I think uh, we will be open to some. It's 7.30, oh. and uh, if anyone does have a question, okay. if you want to say, we'll have to 